Hello and welcome to the Daily Mill for Friday the 10th of June 2022. Now, patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting. Why am I showing you this horseshit? Because our first story of the day is Gary Rowett saying, The players who can make a difference are not quick deals. So everyone, please just relax and wait. Mill boss Rowett on summer transfer window. And this is from londonnewsonline.co.uk. Gary Rowett has revealed he always expected Mill's transfer business to take a while to start moving. The Lions narrowly missed out on championship playoffs for last season, their hopes only finally being dashed on the final day. Millwall appointed Alex Aldridge as their director of football operations and recruitment in March. He had been head of recruitment there before joining Stoke City in August 2020. Myself and Alex have been working incredibly hard to get some deals done and lined up, Lions boss Rout told the South London Press. We've got offers in for players that we are permanently interested in and players on loan. We've met plenty of players over the summer, both on Zoom and face-to-face. -face. What you'll see now, hopefully, is some of those deals coming to fruition. The players you want and can make the difference are usually later in the window than the ones you can do straight away. Once again, uh, we could have signed a whole new team in a week after the season, but it wouldn't be the players I think can, can get us where we want to be. Yeah, it would have been players that have been released by other clubs, so... Most players will st now start with a week to 10 days until pre-season. Start pestering their agents about what is happening. Get me the right club. We've got some really good targets, young athletic players uh, that we want to get into the building. You have to be patient. But at the same time, I respect the fact that people want things done yesterday. And to announce five signings, if you look at the market in general, not many clubs assign many players. I think it will probably go a little bit crazy at the start of next week. Uh, Mill's friendly program is set to start with a uh, short trip to Kent face Dartford on July the 12th. And Mill will re players report back for fitness testing on June 22. So in 11 days time. And then they offer a training camp at Photo Highland in Ireland. So there you go. Now, um, we've got some really good targets. Young athletic attacking players. Now, would that be... The player I told you about in yesterday's video. Did you watch that? Yeah, Manny uh, Longjello from a West Ham United. But, or would it be Ross Sykes, the Accrington defender we've been linked with before? Would it be Daniel Udo, the Shrewsbury striker we've been linked with? Who knows? But here's the thing. Say we've got all these offers in for all these great players that can change the way we play and improve us and get us to where we want to be, which is, I assume, is up 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 what if we don't get those players and then we go back into the players who are released and all the good players that were released have already been snapped up and we're left with the right dregs and we have to try and patch a team together from the dregs of the released players from last season because all the decent players have been released uh, have been snapped up by other teams hmm it could go one way or the other couldn't it um but yeah patience please now why is he saying this because today uh friday the 10th of june the transfer market officially opened now we've been hearing all week about players who've been signing for other clubs but they're not actually signed they've agreed to sign uh, players who've been released um, um transfers that have been done but they they've been done in agreement that they will actually be done uh from today any deal that requires a fee has to be done from today and the transfer window runs until um, the 1st of September so a pretty long uh, window so on that 1st of September and you think the season starts on is it July the 30th so there's a the whole of August how many games would that be? Probably six or so, no? Five or six? Five, five probably. And a cup game or two. Before we can... We could still be signing players after five games. It could be an interesting window. It could be. Um, but we'll see. So there's Gary out telling you to please be patient. And just to show what he said, there's not a lot of bit of deals being done. I'm going to show you how what the deals that have been done so far. 
and um, this is from SkySports.com. They're, they've done a couple of list things here that they seem to be updating. One about transfers, one about kits, uh, one about pre-season friendlies, I think, as well. So they've got these list articles. That if you go on Sky Sports Football Championship, you can see them there, and I assume they keep getting updated uh, uh, as it goes along. But here you can see Burnham, no players in. And it tells you who they've released as well. So um, Blackburn have signed one player on a free. Uh, Blackpool, no one. Bristol City, fair bit of business there. Um, four players in on a free. Two from Guernsey. Guernsey. Um, so yeah, I imagine they're young players to go in their, their youth team. I don't really know about that. But Carl Knight, Carl Naismith's uh, not a bad player. Callum West, Maxfield Town competition. So I imagine that's a young from Burnley. That's a young player who's they've signed and had have to pay compensation for. Um, a lot of players, decent players, there being released by Burnley. Hell of a lot of players there. Cardiff, you can see Cardiff have been the busiest so far. And there was some talk about them signing Gareth Bale, but I think that's complete nonsense. Um, news is that he might be going to Catafe in still in Madrid, so he doesn't have to um, move anywhere. He can stay where he is. Um, you can see that the deals they've done there are four players on a free and someone from Lewis in, in the non-league on an undisclosed fee. They've signed Callum Dowder from Bristol City. That's not a bad player. Uh, Coventry, no one in. Huddersfield, two players in on the free. Um, from Cheltenham and Crystal Palace. Hull, no one's in. Luton, no one in. Uh, Middlesbrough, a uh, player from Watford on a free. Millwall, obviously no one in. Uh... Norwich, one lone player from uh, Isaac Hayden from Newcastle United. Interesting that that's been announced already on loan. Uh, I wonder if he's from the area or what's going on there. Uh, QPR, no one in. Reading, no one. Uh, Rotherham, Connor Washington. Now, this is the one. Because we've been linked with Connor Washington in the past. And there was a lot of talk. Well, is he, is he at Championship Standard? Well, I guess we're going to find out now. Because they've signed him from Charlton and Fleck on a free Rotherham. And we'll probably see he probably is an average championship player, but like Gary Rowett said, we want to be better than that. So we, but we will see. Not only that, um, Rotherham have released a player called Jake Cooper. I thought there was only one Jake Cooper. No, apparently there is another one. There is another. Uh, Sheffield United haven't signed anyone. Stoke haven't signed anyone. Sunderland haven't signed anyone. Swansea have signed someone from Union Berlin. Um, Watford have signed uh, someone from St uh, Stockport County. Uh, West Brom have signed Jason Malumbi, remember him? And uh, they've signed John Swift. So, and we'll, we have to wait and see if uh, they end up signing Jed Wallace. Uh, Wigan haven't signed anyone, so as you can see, um, only two clubs really going guns blazing so far Cardiff and Bristol City. Uh, everyone else not really doing much. Um, so, We'll find out what happens now. Obviously, the weekend's coming up. Um, will there be meetings this weekend? Uh, will the meetings be postponed until next week? I don't know, but we will find out. Uh, something we found out today from newsatlen.co.uk, this story, but it's all over the place. Mill will announce third senior summer friendly. Mill will have confirmed the third senior preseason friendly of the summer, two weeks ahead of the start of the 22 23 campaign. The Lions will travel to Colchester United on Friday, July the 15th for a 7.45 kickoff. Uh, Mill will travel to Dartford on Ju July the 12th before hosting Ipswich Town on July the 23rd. Meanwhile, the under-23s friend fr play friendlies at Dunwich Amnett on Tuesday, July 19th before a trip to Chelmsford City on Friday, July 22, both kicking off at 7.45pm. So, the other day, they told us they were trying to get foreign opposition. Um... The week before we played Ipswich. As far as I'm aware, Colchester United is still part of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. They are not foreign opposition, so this is the week before that game. And they've organised a, a game at Colchester United, so does that mean that the... Um, does that mean the foreign opposition game is uh, a non-goer? It's not happening. Now, the game being on Friday, Colchester United do a lot of games on Friday. For some reason, them and, and Southend play a lot of games on Friday night. I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, 
but uh, I don't think there's anything in that in terms of it being on a Friday so they could probably play the foreign team on the, the Monday or the Tuesday um, maybe the, uh, they, we don't tend to do midweek friendly games do we is there any point so I think it, I would be surprised if we if we did play a game maybe they'll try and get it because of the short pre, um, the short pre-season and they, they know there's going to be a break in November so if they try and get the match fitness in and then I don't know if you remember at the start of the year Frau it said when we had fixed fixed congestion because our Christmas games were postponed because of COVID he said that the players would rather play matches they would prefer playing match after match rather than training a lot of players really fucking hate training especially the running around shit I know I did when I, I was a kid playing football uh, you two as well probably fucking running around the pitch for what um, and running uh, up and down doing sprints um, from the goal line to the penalty box back and then to the 18 yard box and then back and then to the halfway line and back fucking hard work that I'd rather just kick the ball around for, for uh, 90 minutes so maybe the players are all the same maybe we will get a midweek game against foreign opposition but I don't know hard to see it but um, we've got Colchester United so add that to the pile of um, underwhelming meh friendlies um, it's 7.45 kickoff so I imagine you go up there for the day have a drink is it it's kind of on the seaside isn't it it's on an estuary isn't it um, I don't know I haven't been to Colchester I think it is um, not too sure but anyway so there you go um, I'm telling you there's a game against Colchester again really um, disappointing but it's what we've come to expect isn't it um, now I'm going to bring you news this news from EFL.com Mule Chief Executive Kavanagh appointed to EFL Board Mule Chief Executive Steve Kavanagh has been appointed to the EFL Board following the election of a new championship representative at the summer conference. Kavanaugh previously served as, uh, served as the championship's alternate director succeeds Nicholas Randall QC following Nottingham Forest promotion to the Premier League and he joins fellow championship representatives Peter Risdale and Neil Bassor. Following the expiry of the current terms, League 1 and League 2 representatives Jess, Jess Moxie, Steve Kerwood and John Nixon have been duly re-elected and will continue in their positions subject to promotion and relegation. Uh, the board has also agreed to use the power afforded in its articles of association to extend senior independent non-executive director Debbie Jevons CBE's final term by 12 months and fellow independent director Simon Bazalgette has also been re-elected. Um, and then there's a lot of shit there that I'm not going to read. Um, and then so this has come at their summer AGM summer conference they called it and some other stuff has come out from that conference that I think we need to talk about and the first one is this one here EFL to hold talks with clubs over scrapping 3pm blackout and expanding streaming services for Saturday games and this is from uh, I think it's the I newspaper through MSN. Uh, EFL clubs will discuss future broadcasting strategy at the league's AGM on Thursday and possibly pave them away for traditional Saturday 3pm blackout to be scrapped. Clubs will be shown a presentation of options for the future ahead of EFL's TV deal with Sky ending in 2024. There is an appetite for change among some clubs in this week's discussion arise with some in the lower leagues keen to see EFL's iFollow service expanded to cover Saturday games Others argue that will hit crowds and see EFL's decision to canvas opinion at their two-day AGM. I report I, yeah, I think, yeah, I, as in the newspaper I, which is the independent, they stopped publishing it and turned it into a website called I, reported in April that the EFL would discuss with 72 clubs what future broadcasting strategy would look like, including the possibility of scrapping the 3pm TV blackout and expanding streaming for League 1 and League 2 clubs. It's understood all options are open for the future. A uh, source at one of the clubs says there is some support for the principle that a future TV deal 
will be for championship matches only uh, with League 1 and League 2 clubs free to open their matches up to streaming uh, over the iFollow service which charges fans £10 per match to watch their team yeah the Sky only wants the championship Sky like they they pay for the championship they pay for the uh, League Cup basically which because they get the Premier League teams even though it's Premier League teams in names only they, they use their reserves for that competitions kind of devalued it but still and just the League 1 and League 2 gets thrown in there's no value there like they, they hardly put the games on TV they just use them as filler when there's an international break and the championship's suspended so and I imagine they'll use it in uh, November this season when uh, um, again the, the Premier League and the championship's suspended I imagine I don't know if, they, if they're allowed to but I imagine they, they will League 1 and League 2 games will be on like every every week in November um, probably especially as they don't I don't think they have the World Cup so they'll be competing with BBC and ITV um, to try and get some viewers away from the World Cup because why would you would you want to watch some shit teams in the World Cup play each other or, or some shit teams in League 1 play each other I don't know um, uh, that would reflect an acceptance that the bottom two divisions aren't particularly well served by the current TV deal with Sky shown only a handful of games but it does guarantee a chunk of money for League 1 and League 2 clubs so any move towards a streaming first model may meet opposition uh, this week represent well yeah that's the thing if the clubs get um, if it's collective bargaining and they get a chunk based on just being a member of League One, well, but there are big teams in League One. There were little teams in League One, so there are some teams in League One would love to fuck the TV deal, deal off and make their own money through streaming because they'll make a lot more than any other club in the division. And when you're restricting their, their spending on what they can earn, if they can earn more money, that helps them put a decent product on the pitch. Uh, this week represents an initial discussion considering broader strategy rather than rubber stamping any immediate changes. Any move to scrap the 3PM blackout in the future would need to get UA for approval. There is currently a blanket ban on showing matches between 2.45 and 5.15 on a Saturday. Although these rules are relaxed during international breaks when clubs in League 1 and League 2 are allowed to stream Saturday matches if both agree to offer the services. I thought it was a legal thing. Is it not a legal thing? Uh, the blackout, which is uh, the continued support of the Football Su Supporters Association, is intended to protect ticket sales and the habit form and tradition of attending matches. But some say it's an outdated concept and is preventing potential revenue streams for lower league clubs. Uh, the EFL's AGM in Chester and other topics up for discussion at the AGM are the ramifications of the fan led review, which is backed by the league's hierarchy, and there will be a discussion on how to curb pitch invasions and bad behaviour among fans. The EFL has indicated that we'll introduce tough sanctions in the wake of pitch invasions at the end of the season. Ugly scenes at Port Vale and Nottingham Forest, which included a fan assaulting Sheffield United striker Billy Sharp, prompted a strong warning from EFL Chief Executive Trevor Birch that clubs could face severe punishments. Indeed, indeed, indeed. And we had our uh, end of season um, pitch invasion that we normally have and everyone got upset. Uh, some geezer went on the pitch and told everyone to fuck off and that went viral mini um a little a little viral on on the, on the internet um but something weird is happening at the club right now um Millwall are contacting fans who have bought season tickets in the front row of the docker stand and telling them to um move along they have to change the seats so what's happening are they putting nets in they taking the seats out what does that do i don't know and um, they did similar thing in the south stand and uh, they took the front row seats out and put netting in would they be doing that in the dockers i don't know um but they have been doing that so we have to wait and see what what the fuck that's about um but yeah this thing uh with the tv deal now what it is they're, they're they think that a fan who goes to games is the same fan who stays at home and follows the game on either Sky Sports News, um, the BBC, whatever it's called now, Football Focus, is it called? Uh, on on the radio, 
or or on Twitter, live tweets, whatever. And that if you, but it's not. It's different. So there's a name for this actually. It's called fixed pie fallacy. Uh, and this is from the nation of rivers dot com, but that's not really important. I just wanted to show you up. Uh, over at Mises the Old, Matt Palumbo takes down the popular fallacy of fixed pie that claims that if one has a dollar more, that only means that someone has a dollar less. That the rich can go rich off only off of somebody else getting poorer. That is a very popular, not among the laypersons, but even a former Harvard president also believes in it. No wonder the US is in decline. Yes, what do you mean? A fixed pie. Well, there is a fixed amount of money or a fixed amount of fans that will pay money and they go to the games. If you show the games on streaming services, you will take the fans away from that pie and you will have, you will have two smaller pies. But that is not really what's happening. Because you can't count how many fans don't go to the games because they live miles away they live in foreign countries that they can't get there they um they're getting older they're less mobile uh, i know a lot of old people go to the local non-league game instead of the team that they actually support because it's easier to get to but they still get their football fix so what you, so what you do there isn't a fixed pie what you do is if you introduce streaming services and you allow fans to pay for money you have your pie of fans who go to the game and you have another fucking pie of the fans who don't go to the game and can now watch the game even though they don't go to the game they can get a similar experience to the people who go to the game for less of a cost now it's still £10 per match which is about the cost of going to a non-league team I mean uh, Mill's friendly at Dulwich Jam the under 23s is £12 to watch Mill under 23s versus Dulley Jamley, that's £12 to get to that. Now, if you said to me, watch it for £10, I probably would. I would. That would, uh, that would be beneficial to me. And there are other, not only that, but the market can grow. How, how big is your stadium? 20,000? What happens when you get twenty thousand in it? It's crowded. It's uncomfortable. It's it's not easy. To, there's traffic problems. It's hard to get home from the game. How big is the market outside the the twenty thousand who can go to the game? It's fucking infinite. It's infinite. You sign a Chinese player, you can sell the game in China. You sign an Indian player, there's a fucking billion people in China. If we signed an American, American fans would be watching. I remember back in the day, I used to watch Real Madrid play. Why? I didn't give a fuck about Real Madrid. I'll tell you why, because David Beckham was playing for them, Michael Owen was playing for them, Steve McManaman, who at the time, they were all big names in the England team. They were fucking grade A superstars. And they were playing for Real Madrid, and it was on Sky, I had a subscription. But I thought, fuck it, I'll watch it. I haven't since they left. I've fucking gone back to not giving a shit. But that's what that's what can happen when you, the games are on a service that you can stream. So this kind of idea that you're losing one for the other, it's not really what's going to happen. You, if you play it right and do it well, you will have two big pies that you can sustain you. I don't know what the, what the fear is. The only fear would be with people stealing it and pirating it and doing that kind of thing, but actually paying customers um, would be a good idea. I mean, I loved it during during the, the lockdown. I could watch all the games for £10. That was absolutely brilliant. Especially the away games where you, if as a Millwall fan, you get treated like shit. Everyone wants to fight you. I mean, the police want to fucking whack you for no reason. Pay £10 to watch the game and not have to deal with all that shit. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, also, moving on. We're going to move on now. Also, at this uh, meeting of EFL, they have some other things that have come out. 
and uh, this one uh, also from EFL.com new color blindness kit clash amendment what is this about a home club will now be able to wear its away or third kit where a clash may occur that will make it difficult for people who are colorblind to differentiate between the kits worn by teams the amendment also allows clubs to further mix and match elements of their registered kits in order to avoid kit clashes the EFL will also play a more active role in helping clubs identify where a potential colorblind kit clash may occur to give them the adequate notice so that all necessary arrangements may be made in advance um yeah so this is a bit weird i i assume if you're watching if you're a fan of a team and you go to watch them surely you know who the fuck which team is which but apparently apparently it's not that they they see one color as a different color it's like it, it the movement of the colors fucks up there it's like goes blurry and it kind of glitches so they can't see properly it's not that they just substitute one color for another it, ma it makes the, the picture go in their brain go all fucking crazy so it's not just like well you can't tell which club is which like are you even a fan but no it's not that it's like it, it messes up their vision so as long as they let them know um yeah i don't know could be some seeing some funky some funky situations next season of course we are still waiting for our kit to be um revealed i believe it will be revealed uh on the first of july so that is when the, the contract with macron ends at the end of june i don't know why they do it to the end of june why did they do it to the end of june why didn't they do it before then to finish like that literally makes no sense but what are you going to do so we have this area of dead time between the old deal finishing and the new one starting and they know it's going to end but they can't do anything till the deal ends unless they ask Macron for permission and they're going to say yeah fuck off because yeah, they're probably not happy that they're losing the business but what are you going to do so also more importantly the number of substitutes in EFL league fixtures increases oh my god here we go so what's the fuck is happening here um clubs will be allowed to name up to seven substitutes and make five substitutions in skybet championship league one and league two matches from 22 23 season notice there that they did not say league cup for league matches during the 21-22 season, clubs were able to fill three substitutes from seven nominated, which has now increased following Friday's annual general meeting uh, when EFL clubs approved the number of regulation changes that will come into effect immediately. Each club is only permitted a maximum of three opportunities to make substitutions during the fixture, plus an opportunity at half time. And a club may make more than one substitution at each of these opportunities. So you can make five substitutions, but you need to do it, do it in three instances, or you can do it at half time when it's not going to delay the game. Um, yeah, so I think this is basically going back to not what it was last season, but what it was the season before the, the um, season that was delayed because of COVID, where it's suspended from March to June. Um, yeah, um, five from seven. What do you what do you think about that? um good for us bad for us i think it's bad for us because a lot of teams have a, a lot bigger squads and better squads and surely they're going to be able to utilize our their substitutes better than better than us i mean at times in the last season we were having under 23 players on the bench just just to have them there we had, we were playing a freaking 15 year old kid who made his debut became the youngest ever player of a meal war zach lovelace that's how tie it was um so yeah this is don't think this is good for Millwall now not only that but could this see us going backwards in I don't know back backwards in terms of how it was before not backwards in terms of degrading but f f um signing and finding a target man just in in case like a plan b if you've got seven substitutions you can make five um you've got obviously like a goalkeeper you've got a central defender you've got a central midfielder 
and you've got a forward and then you've got ex two extra spaces what do you have do you have um a wide a wide defender a wide midfielder or do you have a target man on the bench um which can we find a target man to come in who will be ha happy to come off the bench knowing that he's plan b he might not even play do we want to play like that um I mean, we did it at the time, right at the end of the season, with sending Jay Cooper up there. Um, and it did work out for us uh, in that game. Do we need a target man striker to come off the bench? Will we be doing that now? Because we're not using uh, three substitutes, we're using five. Um, I don't know, but this seems like it could be a problem for Millwall with our Finn squad. And beneficial to all the other teams in the league. Um, yeah, what do you think? Hey, but so to round it up, uh, this is from Ipswich Town FC.co.uk, and it's basically a list of all the changes that EFL made at today's AGM. Uh, five substitutes, color blindness, kit clashes, and uh, something behind the scenes in terms of business, they've made them put in a hate crime condition. The EFL has added an additional disqualifying condition in its owners and directors test for those that have been convicted of a hate crime, which is defined as an offence that is considered to be aggravated in accordance with the Crime and Disorder Act 1998 and the Sentencing Act 2020. And mandatory articles. The club will now be required to include a mandatory article within their articles of association which states that the directors of the club may refuse to register the transfer of any share where the EFL has not confirmed its consent to the acquisition of control. The EFL has not confirmed that such person is not liable to be disqualified. If registering the transfer of any share would cause the club to breach any other equivalent rule and regulation of any body such as the Premier League or Football Association. Uh, what? Um, that's... What is that about? So I think it means the directors can say they don't want to sell the club to a, a certain individual they can refuse to. Even if they're the highest bidder. Um, just for reasons. And anyway, who gives a fuck? And on that note, thank you for watching and good.